Hey everyone, Az here. I am trying out. Well, it's, I guess it's something new. Um, I've done this before. I've done an audio-only uh, Facebook Live, and I thought, why not try this again? Because I actually, want, I've been thinking about doing a podcast, so I thought uh, this might be a good way to just test out stuff. So you're listening to me via. I'm running through. I'm running my setup. Is I'm doing this from my phone basically. I'm going through a Roland Go mixer. It's an uh, it's an SM57 going to the Roland Go mixer that goes into my phone, so I can still uh, check out my check out this stuff from my computer. So I was thinking about talking about a few different things today, and you guys can you know you guys can. Ask me questions. I'll answer them. So what I might ha- what might happen is I will um, I'll do this. I mean, this is a test. I'm just trying this out. And then what I will probably do is later on maybe download the audio, edit it a bit. It probably won't won't be the most high res audio, but I thought of just trying a simple setup and doing this, get getting this started anyhow. So. I'm just going to share some stories and um, treat it li- a little bit like a radio show, I guess. I'm just holding the mic and just talking. So recently I've been um, started doing a lot of transcribing. So that's one of the things I've been doing. Hey, ZY. Hey, Jackie Lau in the house. Thanks, Jackie. How are you doing? Roman Chang in the house. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, shout out to my friends in Hong Kong listening. So, I thought uh, one of the things I wanted to share was uh, a friend, of, uh, one of my students was asking about practice routines. So I think I'm, one thing I'm going to talk about is um, kind of idea of reverse engineering, how to reverse engineer your end goal to figure out how you're going to do your practice, how you're going to create a practice routine that kind of prepares you uh prepares you uh for an kind of a effective practice session because I know a lot of people who you know practice for many hours. I was talking to a student of mine who actually he practices he told me he practiced for like, I don't know, five five, six hours a day, which I thought was ex- amazingly luxurious to have that many hours. John Lim in the house. Hey John Lim, how are you doing, John? Voice is very clear and nice. Thank you. I'm running, like I said, I'm running to an SM57 going through a roll and go mixer, and that's going to my Xiaomi Mi 4i. And I'm just holding the microphone here, and I'm just testing this out because I, well, I, I kind of think I like the idea of doing this as a Facebook Live, so that if anyone has any questions, then you know I can answer them. So that um, I want this podcast to be something that people want to listen to because it answers their questions like so if you have questions about guitar and music improvisation jazz anything uh, music related that you think i would can help out just you know just ask ask a question and i'll try to answer it so i want to talk a little bit about uh, how to create practice routine that's one topic um second thing i want to talk about tonight is about my experience uh, as a student um, at Berkeley College of Music and how that shaped my music and my playing and um, just my idea of a music career in general. So I think I'll just kind of focus on those two topics today. And as uh, as you guys listen to this and you have any questions, just feel free to type it out. Type it out on uh, Facebook as you're listening to this. Just type it out and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can within the session. So I'm just going to share this. Um, share this on my page as well. So Grio, Grio just him. I miss yourself with your guitar. Uh, don't understand the question. I play my guitar all the time. Um, yeah, today I'm I'm just going to do an audio thing because this is really kind of testing out this thing and see how it feels like, how it works and um yeah. 
So, okay, let's just talk a little bit about practice routine. So, my student has told me he had about, what, five, six hours of practice, six hours of practice a day. But he still feels that, you know, maybe the practice... Um, the practice is working out, he is improving, you know, he's getting better, but uh, he doesn't get to experience new things, you know, like uh, learn something new. Ji Yong in the house, hi Ji Yong. So he doesn't, didn't get to learn something new every day. And so what I realize is that it's uh, very important not just to, um, just a moment, I'm going to turn the mic off, be right back. So, Mazuki Khaled in the house. Hey, Mazuki, how are you doing? So, I'm talking about two topics today. I'm talking about uh, creating practice routines that are effective um, and also about my, so a little bit about my experience in Berkeley. So, the first part, uh, practice routine. So, my, as I was saying just now, my student had about, you know, six hours of practice a day, but he felt that he didn't manage to put in new things into his practice routine. So, one thing I realized is that uh, he said, you know, he was practicing till about, what, 2 a.m. or something. And at 2 a.m., you know, he he realized that, oh, I have, didn't try something new today. And um, you're kind of too tired because it's already time to sleep. Matt Vick in the house. Shout out to Matt. And so uh, I told him my advice was... Whatever you want to experience in your practice session, you know, you, you, you should try to schedule it in. So that's something that has I learned from um, Ross Chef Yin, from Yin, who told me to carefully schedule uh, what I want to experience. So let's say, you know, let's say you have, you know, maybe you have less. Maybe you have an hour of practice or two hours of practice, something. So let's say you have an hour of practice and maybe you want to learn a new song and you're going to practice that for 20 minutes. And then you maybe want to practice some technique development, maybe some finger style technique, maybe practice that for 20 minutes. And um, maybe for the other 20 minutes, the additional 20 minutes, maybe 10 minutes uh, just jamming, just playing stuff you already like, that you really enjoy. And maybe another 10 minutes checking out something new. Like So you could go on YouTube and watch, you know, you know, Levi Clay or Martin Miller, that's what I would do. I'd check out Levi Clay or Martin Miller or check out some of my favorite guitar players and check out what they're doing if they're doing something interesting and maybe spend some time transcribing them or just writing down their concepts, taking notes from uh, their latest video, what they're doing, what I noticed they're doing. And so kind of locating some time for learning something new and just putting that in the schedule as part of the as part of the process, as part of the practice routine. So practice routine doesn't necessarily mean you are on the guitar all the time. It could be watching a new video. It could be reading a new book. It could be getting a new concept, learning a theory thing. Uh, so anything that is challenging you to go beyond your comfort zone to what, you know, what you're used to doing, and I think the main thing is when you're in a practice session and if you sound good throughout the practice session, you should actually be very worried because it means that you're playing things you're already comfortable instead of challenging yourself and playing something new, something that makes you improve and go beyond what you're used to. So this is important to find something new that will challenge you. So that's one thing, uh, learning something new and scheduling that in. And then I want to talk a little bit about reverse engineering your end goal to create a practice routine. So one thing you can do is to um, check out Yin Yin Boy in the house. I just gave a shout out to you just now about um, how I schedule things to make it happen in my practice routine. So it's something I learned from Yin Yin Boy. So... Uh, one another thing I do is uh, to kind of reverse engineer what was the goal, and let's say the goal was, you know, I want to um, sound like I don't know Tom Quayle or Martin Miller. I want to get some of that sounds. 
So some of those sounds. So like, I was watching a Tom Quill video just now, which I just posted on my Facebook uh, timeline. And um, Tom Quill w was doing some pentatonic and blues lines uh, that was using legato playing. So one thing I could do was just learn the lick and figure out, you know, how many notes does he play per pick stroke. And yeah, I'm using the SM57, the one that uh, you were uh, using just now for your video. So it's the same mic, it's running through my phone and I'm reading the comments on the computer screen but I'm talking to the microphone and just holding the microphone. So no no guitar play, I'm just testing this out to see how the audio recording sounds like. And maybe later edit it or just download it and just upload it as you know a podcast. So this is kind of a test, I thought, but it's more exciting to do it live to an audience than just talk. So this is why I'm trying this out. So um, reverse engineering. So I, let's say I watch a Martin Miller thing, and then um, or like wait, Tom Quill just now. I was watching Tom Quill's video, and he does some pentatonic stuff, and something he picks one note, and then he hammers onto two notes, and then he picks another note, and then he hammers on or pulls off to three or four notes. So just watching that video and figuring out how he does it, what is involved, will allow me to create a new practice routine. It's like, okay, I need to create some lines or some exercises that where I pick one note and hammer on to two notes or pick one note and hammer on or pull off to three notes. So just that idea of looking at one lick and deriving a concept and that will allow me to create a new warm-up routine or a new practice routine or new lines or new ideas. So that I think is um, really important because I'm looking at the end product and from that end product I figure out what I need to practice or what I could practice to improve that to improve my practice routine instead of just you know instead of uh, just randomly practicing you know oh I saw online and uh, they said this exercise is really really important or like this uh, this uh, particular lick is the best lick ever. So instead of just going to the lick without understanding the context, I look at the kind of music, the kind of lines, the kind of um, kind of ideas that I want to get in my playing. I reverse engineer that, and that allows me to create a more effective practice routine. So that that's one way around it. Instead of um, just randomly practicing stuff that people told me was important, told me this is important, this is important, this is important. I actually look at the kind of music that I want to create um, that I maybe not, I don't have the facility for you. I can't, I can't play like that yet, but I, I know who plays kind of close to what I like and I figure out what they're doing and that allows me to create practice routines and warm-ups and stuff. So looking at the music and then reverse engineering it. So that's the second concept. So how to, the pract how to create practice routines, tip number one would be um, allocating some time, specific time, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or uh, let's say at 3 p.m. or 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., whatever you want, but not before you sleep. Just, you know, some a few hours, at least a few hours before you sleep or at least the first thing in the day, you know, very early in the day, but actually allocating some time and putting it in your schedule to learn something new, to purposely discover something new and maybe try it out on the guitar. Not to master it, but just to try something new. So that's one. Tip number two would be to look at the music, the kind of music, the kind of uh, guitarist that you admire, that you want to play in that style, and reverse engineering what they're using in terms of technique, in terms of sounds, in terms of scales, in terms of equipment, in terms of tone, and a theory or harmony, note choice, whatever it is, reverse engineering what you like about their playing to create your own practice routines, your own exercises and warm-ups and lines and melodies. So those are my two practice tips. So let's see whether anyone has any comments. Yin says, the voice is really nice and clear. Thanks, Yin. Hello. Thanks for listening. So does anyone have any comments so far any questions i know this is interesting because this is a audio only podcast at the moment I'm trying this out okay so that's the first part of what i wanted wanted to share today one was how to kind of create a practice routine um to purposely learn something new and also how to 
create a practice routine that works for your goals instead of just following someone else's prescribed practice routines. Second one I wanted to share was um, a little bit about my time in Berkeley and how that kind of shaped my playing, shaped my experiences. So at any point, you guys, if you're listening to this and you have any questions about my time in Berkeley, just type it out and I'll, I'll try to answer anything you, any questions you might have. So um, let me give you guys, uh, set the stage, one of my earliest memories of my time in Berkeley. It was winter, deep in winter 2005. It was winter 2005. It was the worst storm that Boston had experienced in about, I think, like something like 10 years. And it was so cold. It was... I remember walking on was it uh, Mass Ave? Ma- Mass Ave is the name of the street where um, the main building of Berkeley was. Um, Uchida, no, not the Uchida building, but um, where the Berkeley Performance Center was, and I was just on Mass Ave, and we were, you know, me and my friends were, we were all looking for a new, a place to stay, and I think um, we stayed at this dorm or something for like a week before we um, found a place to live and I ended up uh, living in this place in Westland Avenue which was opposite a Whole Foods which is nice it's nice to be opposite the supermarket so you know that you can buy food from the supermarket um, and it's just opposite and it was like winter and the snow and and the thing is, it's not about the snow, it's just how cold it felt. It's just the wind chill factor and the wind's blowing in your face. And I just came from Malaysia, fresh from the really hot, nice weather. You don't think of it as hot and nice here, but it's, it's warm, humid, of course, but it's pretty pleasant when you go there and it was just like super cool. But I remember going for classes and I think... Um, I think I'll share one particular class. I remember I had a list of teachers that I wanted to study with. You know, when I went to Berkeley, um, I already had graduated from music college here in Malaysia. So I already had my degree and I was gigging for about two years. And I had a list of teachers that I really wanted to study with. And one of them was uh, this amazing harmony teacher by the name of Steve Roshinsky. Steve Roshinsky uh, wrote the Harmony book, I think he wrote Harmony 4 textbook, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure he wrote Harmony 3. I know he wrote Harmony 4. And it's an amazing textbook uh, where you, you could learn about, well, basically chord progressions, harmony, how, how modern contemporary harmony worked. And he wrote that book, and it, it was amazing. I was just like, this guy wrote the textbook for it, so I definitely want to study with him. And that first semester, because I was a transfer student, I, I was in a class called, I got into his class called Advanced Harmonic Concepts, which is, if you really think about it, first semester in Berkeley and I got into a class called Advanced Harmonic Concepts, is pretty tough. It's a pretty tough class. And I remember the very first class, Steve was, um, I thought Steve was a genius uh, in, in terms of how he organized it. So we had a lot of people in the class, uh, a lot by Berkeley standards. I think we had like 20 to 25 people or something like that, something like that, during the first class. And usually the first week, um, since it's, it's at drop, they call it at drop week, which means that you can try out the classes, you can enroll in the class or try out the class and see whether it's something that you want to be in and you want to study. Uh, and if you don't, think the class is a good match for you it's not like something you want to be in or you want to maybe you wanted to study in that class but you want to study with a different teacher then you get a chance to uh, drop the class and add and go into another section with another teacher so that was what was good about add drop week and so the first class with steve steve was just like throwing i thought i knew my harmony i thought i understood contemporary harmony i did pretty well when i was in uh, in icom studying a contemporary harmony but that very first class with Steve, he was just throwing out all these big words, all these terminology, all these terms and de- definitions and descriptions that I've never heard before. After studying how many to how many one to how many four, all the things he mentioned were like, 
wow, so abstract, so beyond my comprehension. It was so in, so challenging. And I was like, wow, I really don't know anything. And I, I could feel that some of the people in the class felt the same way because, it, uh, I mean, Steve made it look like in the first week that the class is going to be rough, you know, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be very, very difficult. And I think some people got scared because a lot of people, I think, got scared because by the second week, you could see from like, I don't know, 20, 25 people, it ended up being like 10, 12 people or something. A lot of people who came for that very first week during ad drop week just disappeared the following week. So it became a smaller class. And what I realized later on, I'm not sure that I, I, I don't think I managed to ask Steve this yet. I should really ask him one of these days, maybe send him a message. Um, but I think he purposely made the first class really challenging. He, he basically set a standard uh, where um, he wanted to weed out the people who really wanted to be in the class or not. He, he made it look extremely challenging and he threw all these big words in to see whether did you really want to be in the class? Do you, are you ready for a challenge? Are you ready to be challenged musically, intellectually? to learn something new, to be not in your comfort zone. That's what Steve did. And I realized after the second, you know, sec week three and onwards, it was tough. It was a tough class. You know, I learned a lot of stuff. I think I didn't get an A for that. I think I got a B plus. It was a really challenging class for me. Um, but it was actually rather manageable the rest of the time. But the first class was really, really difficult. So that's something that Steve did. Really, I still remember that. And Steve, uh, throughout my time at Berkeley, I ended up taking advanced harmonic concepts. I, I took uh, his advanced modal harmony class. I took his reharmonization class. And I managed to sit in a few of his reharmonization classes as well. And we kept in touch. And uh, he's, he's like a personal hero, one of my um, favorite lecturers in Berkeley during my time in Berkeley, just because of his intellect and clarity of vision in terms of giving a very well-rounded education, you know, um, challenging the students and being uncompromising in, term of, in terms of rates. If you got an A or A- minus or A- plus in his class, it means you did a lot of work and he really, he really thought you did good work because, you know, it's hard to get an A in his class. But if you got it, then I think you know, he, he he graded like what I would consider real world grades. It wasn't a grade based on, okay, you did your work, okay, A. You know, it was like you put in really a lot of work, you know, really dedicated to the class and you get a good grade. So that was really cool. So that's a little story about Steve Wyszynski. Okay, let's see what anyone's still listening to this. Oh, three people listening. Cool guys, thanks for listening. So that's my st story about Steve Wyszynski. How did that change my life in a way? Um, I think the main thing I got from Berkeley, and this this goes out to anyone who is curious about the Berkeley experience. Uh, Berkeley is such a huge school that you know there's so many different kinds of classes that you can take. So many faculty members you can take. Even now, now is even bigger. I believe the the whole thing has expanded. So I think it's really important if you go to an institution like Berkeley to really know what you want or have as as clear an idea at the point in time of what you want to learn and what you want to experience and that will help you navigate through the many many classes that are available there just kind of figure out what you want you know what do you want to study brazilian music do you want to study jazz do you want to study bluegrass do you want to study shred you know if i went back there now i would probably enroll in some classes with John Finn, I probably still take some Tronzo classes. I take some classes with Mick Goodrick, uh, John Damien. Um, I probably take some classes with the same people I studied last time, but I probably end up taking some additional classes. You know, maybe with Tomo Fujita, some people, some faculty members that I didn't get a chance to study with last time. And the thing is, you know, even throughout that time, you know, you, you could be at any Berkeley for four years. I was there for about six semesters. Uh, there's always another teacher to study with, another class that you could have taken. There's so much to learn. And I think Berkeley taught me about the potential of how much you could learn in a week when given the right circumstances, the right faculty, the right environment, the right um, syllabus, the right material, the right resources. 
Um, and I think remembering that environment, I try to challenge myself to create that environment wherever I am, that kind of like growing mindset. That's something I learned from Berkeley. So yeah, guys, so that's my Berkeley story, and that's also my James Taylor in the house. Hi, James. I was just talking about how to create a practice routine, maximizing um, your practice routine by making sure you schedule something new, um, schedule something new into uh, your practice routine, and also how to reverse engineer based on the kind of music you enjoy, figuring out uh, what to uh, what you can learn from that music that you enjoy and c to create your own practice routines that maximize the results because you know you're looking at what you want to sound like and then from that creating your warm up creating your um, attitudes uh, your your studies everything that you want to do is based on the music you want to create rather than randomly choosing um, exercises from the internet or this book and that book and not knowing why you chose it. So that was the first part. And the second part, I was just talking about my experience in Berkeley and how that really shaped my perception of um, time and the value of time and the value of learning and how being in an environment that challenges you outside of the box to challenge your thinking and challenge your playing, challenge your musicality, challenge your perception of how you could use your time. Uh, my time in Berkeley, especially my first semester, was um, just made me realize that time in Berkeley is different, you know. And so since ever since then, I think whenever I remember that experience, I try to I try to create an environment where I'm always learning something new. And that's something I learned from Berkeley. And also I share a story about my very first class with Steve Forshinsky and Advanced Harmony Concepts. So thanks, James, for tuning in. Your podcast for sure uh, is an inspiration to my work. We have Linus me, Linus my, Linus me, Jimmy in the house. So if you're wondering what setup I'm using for this, I am using a Roland Go mixer that I got from Roland Asia Pacific. Shout out to Roland Asia Pacific for providing me with this amazing piece of gear that allows me to plug in my SM57 directly into that and then into my phone. So you're listening to me through an SM57 going through a Go mixer and that goes into my Xiaomi 4i as an audio Facebook live broadcasts and this is a test I'm testing this out because I'm probably going to download this and then um, upload it again maybe on YouTube or and or SoundCloud might edit it might just keep it like this I might just keep it like this and put some music at the beginning and the end probably but this is a test it's always good to challenge yourself and see what you can do so Akihito Fuse in the house hey Aki thanks for tuning in it's all these amazing people tuning in. Um, yeah, I do have a gig with Aki coming up next. Well, not so soon, but sooner than, you know, coming up. So I'm looking forward to performing with Aki in the near future. Aki is an amazing guitarist, seven-string guitarist, uh, who teaches at International College of Music. And I believe wrote the Japanese version of George Russell's uh, legendary book, it's George Russell's book again. Oh man, I can't believe I can't. Uh, the lid in chromatic concept. I think he wrote the. Jap I think Aki did the translation for the Japanese version of the George Russell's lid in chromatic concept. Love the text. I, I read the original English one. I was working through that book. Really good book about ingoing and outgoing sounds. Amazing stuff. So let's see. Okay, guys, I think I'm going to end the broadcast very soon. But does anyone, does anyone have any questions just before I end today's broadcast? Does anyone have any requests, questions I can answer, anything at all? Okay, I think that's it. So, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. This is my, I would say this is my going to be, probably just going to go up as my very first podcast. Um, and... I appreciate you listening in, tuning in. So a few things you can do if you're listening to this on YouTube, please click subscribe 
to my YouTube channel to be informed of new videos and new audio broadcasts. If you're listening to this on SoundCloud, please follow me on SoundCloud. If you're listening to this on Facebook, please click like and share and leave some questions or any requests of anything I could share in a future broadcast. So thanks so much, guys. Um, oh, yeah. Another thing you guys can do, if you enjoy this broadcast and want to support me, uh, you can also um, donate uh, to my paypal.me page. It's paypal.me slash azsamatmusic. A-Z-S-A-M-A-D-M-U-S-I-C. I'll leave a link in the Facebook se- uh, comment section later. I'll pin it. So if you can... In fact, that one is probably... You can leave it in Malaysian Ringgit as well. You can um, leave me a tip if you enjoyed this broadcast, if you got some value from it and you just want to support so I can do more broadcasts like this to answer questions from you guys or talk about different experiences I've had over the years in the music industry. So thanks again. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you guys have a great night or great morning, depending where you are. Take care, and I'll see, see you again in the near future. Bye-bye.